I think it's wonderful. You all came here, the confusion about whether it's going to be at the Walk or at the Cold Center, because usually this program or this continuing program called Talking Dance has been at the Walker. It was, as you know, it's funded by Judith Brent Ingber in honor of Gertrude Lippincott. And I don't know about all of you, but I asked if whether many people here had ever been to the program Talking Change, and I'd love to just see a show of hands. Talking Dance, it isn't Talking Change. Talking Dance. I think it's one of the most interesting programs in the dance world because we get a chance to really meet and hear from people in the field who are working. And dance, as you probably know, is not very much in the conversation. And I think most people think dancers move, they do not speak. If they do speak, they're inarticulate. So <laughs> I think one of the nice things about this program is that you get a chance to hear very articulate people. And sitting beside me is a very articulate person. And it's a real honor for me to be sitting beside Valda, whom I've so enjoyed over many, many years of watching in performance and uh, admiring so hugely as the, and the work continues. I was trying to think, maybe this isn't the place to say, but I think as I'm watching you perform rather lately, she has an ability to hold the stage, be a, just a presence on the stage as clearly as anyone I've ever known. And it seems to me that that grows and grows and grows in your career. But I wanted to go back today, and by the way, the format of this, I think roughly is supposed to last an hour and a half, is that correct, this program? Yeah? No. All right, fine. <laughs> and I just, thought, I just thought we'd start talking, and then at some point we'd like to just stop and throw it open to questions and so forth from all of you. And don't be shy. Please don't go home thinking, oh, I wish I'd asked. Oh, I wish I'd thought. So be thinking. But I thought I'd go back to the beginnings, because I know that Valda came. Uh, first of all, when I first saw her today, I said, is anybody else in the world named Valda that you know? <laughs> and I said, yes. <laughs> um, my father's name was Valentine. My mother's mother read about a violinist named Valda Aveling, and she suggested to my mother that maybe they would call me Valda, and maybe my father would like it. And they did. Yeah. And when I went to London, ultimately, and I studied with Marie Rombert, she knew about this, this uh, violinist, and she, she was very uh, interested. She thought maybe I was a relative or something. <laughs> I wasn't at all, but she loved to make those kind of connections. But that's how I have that name. And it's actually not an easy name in America because people say Valda, 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 all kinds of things. But in Europe, it's such an amazing pleasure because they always get it right immediately. It is never a problem. We can be in the smallest place in Russia and they know exactly how to say it. And it's a pleasure. So I'm happy to have it. And I do remember at one point saying to Merce, sometimes I wish I had a more ordinary name. And he said, do you, do you really? Because he said, I sometimes thought, you know, maybe I would wish I wasn't called Merce, but actually I really like being called Merce. So we, we sort of drank a beer together or something, but liking our names. Oop, did you uh, grow, out, uh, grow up outside of London? Um, and, and, and did you have siblings? I have no siblings. I grew up, I was born in a small seaside town not so far from Dover on the southeast coast. Um, but the war came when I was four, five. So I had barely any training because as soon as I, my mother thought dancing was graceful for girls and so I should do some. So I began having lessons but almost immediately they dropped a bomb nearby and so they sent me off to school over there and then I had a lesson there and they dropped a bomb there and I went over there and, and I had some dreadful teachers. Um, a woman who put her knee in the small of your back and yanked your shoulders back oh. and said, stand up straight. Oh, and, um, and then ultimately, uh, people who, 
who seemed to be interested in me, but decided that I, you know, they had to get me on because I was old and tall. And so they made me do things that distorted my body amazingly. And I would <laughs> hold on to the bar for dear life while they were telling me I must turn out, I must get my leg up. And I said, but if I let go of the bar, you know, I'm going to fall down. And they said, don't worry about it, don't worry about it, just get your leg up, turn <laughs> out. And I really, I really was gr grotesquely distorted in an effort. I mean, I, had no, I didn't know what else to do. I read books, but I didn't know how to find any kind of training or anyone who would help me. And so I knew how to part my hair. I, I knew how to do all the sort of external things. And I was considered very musical. And I sort of thought, well, if I'm lucky, maybe I can have a career where I do dances in long dresses so no one can see that I can't straighten my knees and I don't have very pretty feet. And they'll be sort of dramatic. And, and I can use my arms a lot because people said I had beautiful arms. But I, I hardly knew anything. It was all a dreadful sham. And I knew that, <laughs> but I didn't know what to do about it. And the story goes that you came to the U.S. when you were about 24. That's right. You came with your friend David Vaughn, and that's an interesting. I'd love to have you go back to that and then connect that to right. why in this world did you find Merce or look for Merce when All you right. came to this country. Are you ready? Yeah. Well, I, came, I met David Vaughn in London, who had been living here for some time and went back to visit his family and went to his his old teacher, where I was also studying, who was a bright woman who was trying to, she taught, quote, modern classes. And she had very different ideas about technique um, from Rambert, whom, uh, Marie Rambert, who studied, worked with Nijinsky on Sacre du Printemps, studied with Dalcroze. She was a wonderful, wonderful woman. And I managed to study with her in London because she had a real sense that if you wanted to dance, she would take you. And uh, I, she sensed in me that I wanted to dance. She had no idea about alignment or training the body. It was all about belief. If you, if you believe you can do it, you, will, you can do it. But of course, that wasn't very helpful when you were out there alone. When you stared at her, you held your balance, you know, and it worked. But without her, you, her, her we were staring lost. back at you. But she gave me the most wonderful opportunities, and I learned Giselle, I learned Albrecht. I mean, you learned the boys' parts, the women's parts, everybody's parts, because she used to say, you know, someday maybe you'll have a company and you need to know these things. And Diaghilev had told her that. And she indeed did have a company and so forth, but I was too tall for that company. David Vaughan said to me, in America, they have other kinds of dancing which isn't dependent on size, shape, length of leg, degree of turnout. Um, if you came to America, I'm sure something would happen. So I went off to Italy in a review where I learned, I earned a fair amount of money doing work that I had never dreamed I would do, very sort of, you know, sexy dancing in high heels. Which, but it was, that was again, a wonderful, wonderful experience. I saved a lot of money and I came to America. And David Vaughan didn't want to influence me, but he talked about various people and introduced, there was a little party. I didn't meet Merce at that party because I think Merce was out of town. But I began studying with all sorts of people, some of them quite famous. I was not happy. Um, first of all, in England, we had classes in the morning, which was when your energy was at its best. And then if you had a job, which you needed to pay the rent and the bills and whatever, you did it at, at night or later. Uh, I worked in the first coffee shop, the first espresso coffee shop in London. But, but your energy went to your dancing. And when I came to America, everybody took class in the evening and did their jobs in the day, which was an odd situation. And so I went to lots of classes and I met people who seemed to be in some deep private 
fantasy <laughs> that excluded you totally. <laughs> and they sort of bumped into you in class and they were in sort of ecstatic states. And, I, and then they went home and you, did, you never spoke to anybody, nev nothing ever happened. And I, I wasn't very happy and I didn't say a lot. I mean, some of these people I was studying with were quite famous. I think now they possibly didn't want to teach, it was the only way they could make a living. But at that point, I didn't know what was happening. I didn't say anything for the longest time. But after a while, I, sudden, I said one day, excuse me, are the knees over the toes? And do I drop the back on this movement? And the teacher looked at me in amazement, like nobody ever asked this kind of question, and said, if it hurts, it's good. <laughs> and I knew then that this was not where I wanted to be. And through a series of happenings, either by chance or luck or whatever, I found myself at Mercy's class, but I was a little wary at that point, and I said, maybe I could watch. And they said, sure. And uh, so I sat and watched. And first thing that happened was this very tall man walked in. And I said, who's that? And they said, oh, that, that's Merce. And I was thrilled because in England, the male dancers that had been at Ron Baron and where I studied were sort of about the size of jockeys. I mean, they were really small compared with me. And, and suddenly, I was looking at a dancer who was taller than I was. I mean, and, and this amazing back and this amazing neck. You mm. all know, I'm sure you remember all mm. of that. And then the class began, and it was very, there was a very clear process of alignment going on, which I absolutely identified with because it's what I had learned in my ballet training. And on top of that, there was a, such a brilliance, breathtaking brilliance of rhythmic structure of the exercises, which made me understand that I could really try this world because rhythmically that was the way I did everything. And here was somebody producing a, a, a sort of amazing panorama of rhythm that, that knocked me for a loop. Um, plus a, a range of steps that I would never even have considered and, and, and putting them together in context and all kinds of things. So, and then we went out to supper, all of us. We went to the <laughs> automat. And, and I remember talking with Merce and um, I thought, this is, this is a world. And people were talking about other concerts and music and you could go and see things and they'd say, if you hand out programs, I can get you in for free. And Merce laughed and said, you know, we have no money, but we share everything. And they did, and that's what it was like. And I thought, this is a world. And I said to Merce, I want to come and study with you. And he said, good, well, when you've made your decision, come and talk to me and don't worry about the money. And I never paid for class, mm -hmm. which since I was earning $27 a week at the Art Students League posing for painters um, was a big help. And I went to Merce immediately. And there was Merce. Should I stop? No. Oh, yeah. No. Oh. no. And Merce. <laughs> I'll go this way. We'll and Merce. I, I was thrilled and I was sort of dizzy in ecstasy with these incredible rhythmic things that were going on. And Merce came up to me and said, don't make it so pretty. And I thought, <laughs> What does he mean? I mean, my mother always said, why don't you smile more? Or you could use your arms better. Or, you know, and, and this man is saying, oh, wait a minute, I get it. I get it. And I, Merce was the first person who really taught me to strip down to the bare bones of the step. And that was, there was its beauty, its contrast, its excitement, its pleasure, and I learned how to do it from Merce, and he let me do it. And he let me do it even when I got in the company and I was learning things. And I would say to him, you know, I'm, I'm working at this, is this okay? And he said, yes, I know it's okay. And there was a point where I remember saying to him, I think I'm 
you know, I'm so drunk on the rhythm that I'm not really getting all these little steps in that, that I need to be there. And so what I think I'm going to have to do is give up my pleasure in the rhythm for a minute and just get those little steps in. So don't think I've gone crazy if you see that I'm not in time with everything. Because I, I think the only way I can learn to do this is to actually do them. And then if I keep doing them, I'll get quicker at them. And then I can get back into the rhythm. And he said, I understand. It's fine. Do it. And I thought, this man is amazing. This man is letting me learn while performing as well as being in class. And that was thrilling because I guess at some point I thought, you know, I, I seem to have the reputation. I was, I was more like a, a person in, in the company where people, some people said the company were cold and the dancers weren't alive to them as people. And I was one that was. But I didn't indulge it. I could have, you know, it would have been really easy, I think to be the one who, who we all love, because she, she smiles at us or whatever. But I didn't do that. I really, I learned from us the, the real rigor of paring it down to its, to its guts, as it were. And I thank him forever for that, because it's what I still do. And I'm not the strongest technician. I never was. Um, because I guess, you know, all those early years was, it just wasn't happening. But I am honest. I'm really honest on stage. And that counts for a lot. And I do believe that there's never a time to stop learning, because it's possible. And if I thought that it, it was happening to me that I wasn't learning or I didn't want to, because it requires you know, effort and time and thought and energy and eating right and sleeping enough and all those things, I would probably not do it. But I, don't seem to have gotten to that point yet, and so I'm doing it. Yeah. Thanks please to Please keep doing it, okay? Right. Please keep doing it, because it changes. Yeah, it does. Your, oh, it did. It, yeah, it does. changes yeah. a, a great deal. How, how big was the company when you were in it? Because there weren't that many dancers. No. You had were. to fit in the Volkswagen bus. Yeah, it was Carolyn, Viola, Remy, um, Marilyn Wood, uh, there were about five or six yeah. of us. But you, ha you, you had to fit in the bus. Well, that was when the bus came. The bus didn't happen immediately. John yeah. won the bus. Oh, did he? John Tage huh? was in Europe on a, <laughs> on a television program called La Sierra Doppio, which was like the $64,000 question. And John <laughs> won the program. Um, by answering questions on mushrooms, which he chose, and he chose the subject. And so John bought the Volkswagen bus for the company. And that, indeed, we all had to fit in the Volkswagen bus because it was a designer or a stage manager, and what scenery we had was piled and on the top. And top. Yeah, and we took a great deal of food with us because we had very <laughs> good friends in New York um, who made things for us to take. And John would cook at night. We almost always stayed in motels where you could cook. And um, we ate superbly, because John was also great at finding local farmers who raised vegetables or raised animals. So we had you know, steak and corn and everything local. And John cooked it, and it was wonderful. And I think when we got back to New York, we didn't pay for anything. We didn't pay for the hotel. We didn't have single rooms. If anyone was really sick, they got a single room, particularly if it was a cold, something that could, we could catch. You know. But mostly, we, we had double rooms. And we got, I think, something like $15 a performance when we got home, having had the most sumptuous, wonderful time of our lives. Um, we were like pioneers. I mean, we were not always in great theaters. Um, and we sometimes had audiences that were extremely small, frequently the janitor and his son and a few other people. Um, and didn't a great many people walk out? 
Well, not not then, because there weren't enough people to walk. Right. <laughs> but uh, later, yes, a great number of people walked out. We can just share out. it right here. A lot of people walked yeah. out at the end. But, yeah. but um, at that point, we were, we were really like pioneers. I mean, it was amazing and wonderful. And, you know, John, I mean, you could find yourself in a room. I mean, I, I went and cooked one day for John because um, he asked me if I had a recipe with X number of words and I gave him a recipe and he said, oh, I love that. It was a green sauce that you made with herbs and so he asked me if I would make it sometimes and I sat in kitchens with Marshall McLuhan and uh, Bucky Fuller, Buckminster Fuller and Norman O'Brown and, and there I was chopping the garlic and doing everything and I mean they were, they were phenomenal days, you know, amazing. Miro in France, mm -hmm. uh, they were extraordinary days, but we were like pioneers, and we mm -hmm. did our work. And, and I, uh, Carolyn's book, right, which is called um, Change, Ch Chance, Chance and something, Chance and something, hmm? There's a Chance and circumstance. Yep. Chance and circumstance. Okay, but I think she describes very well those early days right. when everybody was trying to help each other get along. I mean, the musicians, the decor people, the, mm. well, the painters. So it wasn't a question of, you know, me, 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 and I will go. It, and if you had food, wonderful. If you had an extra place to, to sleep, wonderful. Come on in. I can house you for a couple of weeks before, you mm. know, while you... So there was an enormous amount of of, of sharing oh, and, yeah. and cooperation. Yeah, it wasn't um, a very isolated group at all. No, no, no. 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 Uh, you, how long did you stay in the company? Well, it was hard because in the beginning we didn't sign contracts. I mean, nothing. You yeah. know? I mean, I, uh, the first time I went away with the company in the Volkswagen bus, um, I was not technically in the company, but Viola was ill. And uh, Merce didn't seem to want to quite tell her that perhaps she shouldn't come. She had hurt her foot badly. She was frail, Viola. Um, mm. but, but morally very strong, but f physically strail, fails, uh, frail. And finally, Merce did tell her that he thought that she shouldn't come and I should go in her place. Um, and Viola wept in the corner and I was English and I didn't quite know what I should do. I didn't want to barge in and learn something so I sort of stood at the back and so it was weird but I went on one of those tours and then and in those days I mean we did three weeks usually in the spring very often in Illinois and that was it until the summer when sometimes Merce went to Europe alone and then later went with Carolyn primarily to music festivals. It was through John or Earl Brown or Christian Wolf that they went. Mm -hmm. um, so there wasn't a lot of work. Mm -hmm. So you didn't sign anything. You know. I remember hearing that one year there was one and a quarter um, engagement for the company and the quarter was a lecture by David Vaughan. Oh, really? There was one performance, oh. and David Vaughan, yeah, well, <clears throat> the archivist. Yeah, maybe. Yeah. Ar so I, I was around, I mean, then I didn't go on the world tour. I had a baby. Um, Merce was very thrilled. Um, and I, I, I knew, though, at that point that I, I miss, when they left, I was sort of bereft. I sort of mm. Where are they? What's happening? And I met them in London because I went to visit an aunt of mine who was ill, actually. And um, the company looked, the women particularly, sort of actually, frankly, looked like hell. They had never worked so hard. They had never danced so much. They didn't know how to deal with it. Um, Carolyn had a hard time because Viola smoked. They had to share a room. Viola wanted to smoke a cigarette. Carolyn didn't like cigarettes. All yeah. those things assumed yeah. massive yeah. proportions because they were so tired and so exhausted. And Merce, I, I went to the Phoenix Theater and Merce was on the stage. It was in the daytime, they were rehearsing. And he jumped off the stage and ran up the aisle and hugged me. And he was thin as a rail. Mm -hmm. He was so thin. He looked as if he was exhausted, but he was 
so happy. Mm -hmm. He was thrilled to be doing that, mm -hmm. that much work. Mm -hmm. And he was getting such accolades from people like Peter Brook and the theater and the movie people in London, which for him was glorious, you know. Mm -hmm. and, and I think that was an immediate thing that we connected on was because I had been on the stage a lot. I hadn't grown up in a university. My training had not been there. My training had really been in performance. It'd been British pantomimes. I'd been in Giselle with Rambert. I'd been in the Review in Italy. I mean, I knew a lot of strange and other things. I knew how to wear a costume. I understood things that he understood and that some of them were not so familiar with. They had, you know, much, they could get their legs up and they were much technically much more advanced than me, but there was a kind of theatricality that I knew about that I think Merce knew about, and it was one of the things we enjoyed together, mm -hmm. right from the beginning. And on that tour, which was hard, they'd never been on, they were on the road for something like three, three four months, and, and so the money was all raised by painters who, who sold paintings and, yeah. and gave the money to the company to make this t tour possible. And they were, they were sort of, exhausted, and many of them left at the end of it, by which time Merce asked me if I would like to come and do um, summer space, which was terribly hard. You know, it was f full of things I hardly knew how to do, but I went and learned it and did it, and, um, and that was sort of the beginning, but we still didn't sign contracts at that point. And so I stayed for, what, 10, 12 years. And in a way, I, I never quite left. I mean, yes, I left. I had a car accident, a bad car accident. I was just going to say. Yeah. yeah. Which you know about, because you... We well, talked. I do. I was going to ask. I was hit by a train. I was in a car that was hit by a Long Island Railroad train. And we won't go into it a lot, but I knew before I, that happened that it was time for me to leave Merce. Merce was not dancing as much, and dancing with Merce on stage was divine. It was, Merce was the most present person on stage I think perhaps I've ever worked with, consistently present, I've ever worked with. I mean, there, were, there was an amazing moment in Rainforest, which we had very little rehearsal of. I just wanted say that Rainforest is going to be part of the repertory that right. they'll be going to be doing at the Walker Arts Center right. next weekend. Well, I, I was going to do it with Merce, and Merce was injured, but he wasn't really talking about it too much. So we didn't rehearse very much. And there was Merce, the thing that Merce had that was always, ex well, one of the things that Merce had, was he had phenomenal speed. And we had both, in my early ventures into the company, I had, I had sort of laughed about it because I had, I had learned something by myself because I didn't have a partner and I didn't dream that Merce was going to be my partner. I was the new girl. And I thought, well, I'll learn it in case anybody else falls out or hurts themselves, so I'll learn it. And, and after a while, Merce came and stood behind me and I thought, Huh. He can do it with me. It was terribly fast, and it whizzed over there, and it whizzed back here, and it was very hard. And he did it with me, and I, I could barely keep up with him. And the change of direction from going over there and over there, you were on one foot and you hopped all the way back over here. And it, I could either have burst into tears, I think, or laughed. And I laughed, and I said, you know, you're like a jet airplane, and I'm like some old bicycle, tricycle. <laughs> and he said, how can I help you? Oh boy. And I said, well, I think if you, if you would put your hand here so that when it's time to change direction, if you could just give me a little. And he said, of course, of course. And that, that was beginning, I think, of a real relationship that very few people had with him. And I don't know whether it was because they were all they were all very involved in their perfection of technique, and I didn't even have that possibility, you know. <laughs> but he never, I mean, he enjoyed it, I think. He enjoyed the fact that somebody said, this would work, this week, and so we'd, something happened between us. 
So when we got to Rainforest, years later, we hardly had any rehearsal because he was injured. And I, there was a sort of twister that we did. We, you held hands and you whizzed around in a circle together and every now and then I would drop to the floor and then come up again and we would keep going. And I was always afraid that he would pull me over. And we didn't rehearse it. So in performance, I suddenly realized that if I actually gave him my weight, it would work. But if I shirked it, yeah. it I would, he, would, he would pull me over. So I, I fell to the floor, got up again, and gave him my weight, and we whizzed around more. And it was so exciting, I did about four extra ones. <laughs> <laughs> and Merce, there was a second in his eye where he sort of looked at me and said, what, what in God's name do you think you're doing? <laughs> but he, ne he didn't say it, he was right there, right there, and we did it, we did it, we did it, and it was over, it was one. And, and afterwards I said to him, must I, I'm sorry, he said, it's okay, I got it, I really knew. And he did, and I really trusted that man all the time. And, and it was interesting actually to talk about this to the present company who don't perform with him anymore. Oh, right. And they said to me, this is wonderful. You're telling us about a man we don't know mm -hmm. because he sits quietly and watches and he says wonderful things. But we've never had that experience. Mm -hmm. And it was, it was heaven, you know, and you could, you could risk and he'd be there for you. And he could risk and you would know how to deal with it too. So for me, it was sumptuous, but when Merce stopped performing, I began to miss it a lot. And I think he was obliged to make, at that point the company was getting more dates, he had to make more work, um, they wanted the pieces with the, with the sets by big designers, because the big painters, because they could sell them in the towns they were going to. And I thought it was probably time for me to not be there. But then I had an accident. And um, it was devastating. And I should tell you, because people who don't know this, when I finally was well in, I had real bad amnesia. And when I finally, I walked, when I felt well enough, I insisted I must go alone to the studio and see Merce. And I did. And I sat there and every now and again he would talk about something outside the window which would sort of give me a rest. And I told him that I thought that I should not stay. But I didn't want to go anywhere else. I just felt that the time had come. And um, he asked me if I would be in the next piece. And I said I would. And as we began learning it, I realized that I couldn't remember it, the steps very well. And I, that was very alien to me because I'd always been really fast. And I said to him one day, you know, I think since my accident, I'm not, I'm not able to pick things up very quickly. And he, w he said, I think you're right. And I thought I would faint at that moment. It was so terrible. And then it was such an amazing relief that somebody who knew me, and there wasn't just a doctor saying, well, it'll pass, I, you know, I had to shout at you in the, in the operating room, but I thought your eyes flickered, and I thought, oh, she'll be all right. And suddenly somebody who knew me said, no, it's different. But that person also said to me, he said, it's like a physical injury. You know, when, when you hurt yourself, you have to rest the injured part, and then you work it just a little bit and then you rest it, and the next day maybe you can work it a little longer, and that's the process that you have to go through. And he said to me, I think that's what's happening to your brain, because there was a lot of head stuff. And he said, I, I see you go away. I just see your concentration, I see your presence disappear. But what I'm seeing is you're staying with me longer every day than, than you were a week ago, for instance. So he said, come to class, I'll come and stand near you, you can ask as many questions as you like, 
and I would go to class. I mean, class was, I knew class. It was my world, it was my life, and the company and our friends, and it was what we did. And suddenly I had no idea what was coming next. I couldn't remember anything. And he would see the sort of panic, and he'd say, it's all right, it's all right, just like this. And he'd talk through it as we did it together. And he's, he was really enormously responsible for my recuperation, I think. And for people who say, you know, it was, it's so cerebral and people didn't, there was no care, no, all those things, nonsense. I mean, he was, he was fantastic. And I said to him one day, I had lighter moments, I said, I think maybe I should read detective stories, because we used to read them on the road and we would lend them to each other. And he's, I said, maybe it would help me follow something through. And he, he used to leave them for me in the studio. He would hide them in places in brown paper bags from the grocery <laughs> store, saying, for VS. And I'd find them behind a radiator. And so after a while, I would sort of go and look for them. And, and we could chat about them. And, and life began to happen again. Yeah. But I, I think it's, it's really amazingly important that people know that. He was astonishing. I mean, there were so many incidents of it that that were great, and uh, he had real amazing compassion and heart for me, and, and uh, I will never forget those things. I sort of hate to interrupt you I at know. all, I but I think, because um, the car accident was something I wanted to ask you about, yeah. and the recovery, in which you've just really described well. Somewhere in here, you met a man named David Gordon, whom you married, and right. I'm not quite sure when that was, and you had a child right. in the garden. He right. was now making wonderful work himself. Right. And um, I, I wondered, what, if the car accident must have been uh, the moment when you were in the recovery, just knowing that, that was not gonna, you weren't going to continue dancing the way you had right. with the Merce Con. But somewhere along in the line, I remember you coming to the Walker Arts Center. I wonder if anybody else does. And I think David choreographed the piece, because then he began to choreograph for you, as I remember. Well, he made, he made chair, which is later. Well, but that's later. But he made chair after the accident, because after the accident, even though I left Merce and it was my choice, I, I didn't know what I was going to do with myself. I mean, I was 40 and a bit, maybe. Um, and I had no idea what my life was going to be. I mean, I'd always been a dancer. I'd always gone to class. And David made chair, actually, because he wanted to make something that I, I couldn't compare my current self to yeah. my former self. He didn't tell me this for years, and I didn't figure it out, yeah. actually. I just thought he was making a very different kind of work that he made that I didn't know anything about. You know, it was, it, so um, that was then, but... But well, is it my imagination? I think he made a piece for you that I think I saw on the Walker stage. And the first section, you danced a very simple piece in a rectangle, as I remember, with clothes on. And then shortly you repeated that same dance with clothes off. And that has has always fascinated me because I thought the body was so beautiful with the clothes off. And ever since then, I've really thought that really clothes kind of screw things up. Well, <laughs> they do. Uh, they, very often they really do. They obscure and things. They obscure you know, things. They do. And it was so beautiful when you took the clothes off and did the same thing, totally the same way. Does that ring any bell? Well, not not exactly, but but I did, I did. He did make for me a, Moy, a solo based on positions of Moy, of, of Moybridge, Edward Moybridge, the photographer. Oh yeah. Which I have done naked. I did it naked a lot, and I did it in clothes, and uh, well, maybe because I'm because Moybridge actually, I mean, those photographs, particularly of the women or the sports people. Or there were a lot of people um, injured or maimed people, and he helped the medical profession a lot because he he made so many photographs a second so they could see how a person with an injured leg, for instance, managed to get up from a chair or or sit down or walk a step or so. So I did do that uh, naked 
a lot. Maybe yeah. that was it. I think it probably Maybe was. Maybe that was it. it was probably just... was. And I've still been doing it. I did it actually in Russia. Um, I do, oh, I do it in bits and pieces all over the place. Yeah, I did it in Utrecht with Boris Sharmatz at one of the Expo Zero expositions. Yeah. No, no, no. It, it keeps going in some fashion or another. Well, I remember just being so moved by it. Yeah, yeah. I'd never seen anything like it before. And um, <clears throat> just moving ahead, I had a great time, and I urge you all, people always say, oh, just Google her, you'll get a lot. And I did, don't ever just Google, but I did just Google, about a set of field. It's a rich, rich uh, vein that you tap into. And uh, so many things that I could not bring, I could not um, you know, replicate. But I wondered when you really got involved, what was the first so serious, serious? theater piece that you did. And did you go back to theater school, <clears throat> acting school? Um, so I want to ask that part of it, how you uh, got in, because you've been doing some great work, and certainly lately, mm -hmm. and continuing. Mm -hmm. But how different is it, training the voice and training the body and warming up? Mm -hmm. You want to? Yeah. <laughs> yes, OK. It's very different. It's a lot. Yeah. Um, I was working with David, and I, because I mean, because of English pantomimes and all those things. I mean, I'd always done a fair amount, of, without knowing how. You just did it, you know. And singers were always saving their voices, and you just, you just went in and did it. So, but I did go. I went to Herbert Berghoff, which was a place that was inexpensive. You could also um, audit classes. And um, I found a teacher there that, because people kept saying to me, oh, you, you don't need lessons. I mean, you know everything. You've been on the stage. And I said, no, I really need lessons. I want to go back to the beginning. And I found a man there called Edward Morehouse, who was also working with Gary Christ. I don't know if any of you know Gary Christ. He was a Joffrey dancer, did a wonderful Petrushka. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And he was studying there. And, and uh, so no, I absolutely did. And, uh, but again, it, it, you know, it was sporadic because then we would get a tour or we'd get a date or something and have to do it. But the, the, the breathing is entirely different. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I now take, there's an English, great English teacher called Patsy Rodenberg who is in America sometimes, um, who has worked with Shakespearean actors, uh, Judy Dent she works with, Rafe Fine she works with. She also works with women in prisons, uh, she works with uh, politicians who have to learn how public speaking. She's fabulous, and when she's free and I'm free, I go there. I also study with another woman who is a, actually an Alexander teacher. Uh, when I can, I go to her. Um, she worked with a man named Carl Stau. Do you know about Carl? Yeah. It's Jessica Wolfe, I think. Yeah. yeah, it is Jessica Wolfe. Yeah. And I was there last Monday, I think, a week, almost a week ago, yeah. And I go to her when I can, and I work privately. And uh, it's, it's wonderful and interesting work. Um, there's a tremendous lot about acting that I've never studied fully. I mean, I've done sporadic things with people. Um, but at my age, if I sort of went back to school for three years, I wouldn't I wouldn't be doing any work, which is, would be hard. So, um, and, and actors are very generous, I find, or they are to me, certainly. And uh, so I, I'm happy to learn from working, if that's ever possible, which it sometimes is, although in this economy it's harder and harder because you don't get auditions anymore. They call in people they know. And then they, they give you a piece of paper saying, we're looking for a Ver Vanessa Redgrave type. <laughs> and you think. With white, white hair. Yeah, I mean, yeah. you know. I, I, find, I just had one tiny little moment with the Bill T. Jones company because I was supposed to speak. Yeah. I had never spoken on stage before, and it was terrifying. And I learned a great deal and about warming up the voice. I had no idea. I mean, I was quite ready to do the, the, the physical warm-up, the body warm-up, the mental warm-up, but uh, the voice. And thank God there was somebody in the company who had some training. And so we'd go backstage and, and we'd do the, um, I've forgotten what they are now. 
but and uh, so you're lucky. I will not demonstrate. <laughs> uh, so what do you you've been to Link Vostok? I mean, I I want to begin to open it up now to some questions. But would you like to describe sort of what your current, most current, focus is, or what you're most uh, challenged by? Oh, I think everything. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, I I. You know, I love being things that interest me, which means I don't do anything very commercial and I'm, I'm not, my son always says very sweetly to me, well, you know, I mean, if they send me for an audition for a woman of my age, I never get it. As Marion Seldy said to me one day, she never gets them either. Because we don't look like a conventional idea of what an older woman should look like. I should be twice the size, I shouldn't walk easily, I should have trouble sitting down. I, it's grotesque, you know, <laughs> and, and that doesn't happen. But I will, I will do anything that interests me, and that's rare but possible and wonderful. It's usually not, you know, highest paid in the world, but it happens. And so I'm, I keep pushing away and I say to people, yes, you know, call me. I'd, I'd love to do that. And uh, sometimes it happens. You remember, of course, that Merce always said, don't forget to say yes. <laughs> Did he? It, in response to a request or an idea, yes. <laughs> no, is a, it's such a negative and it just, you just yeah, stop. No. Yes, you don't know where you're going. That's not the important thing, the goal. But it's the whole process of, yeah, yeah opens it up. And don't forget what Gloria Steinem said when she got to be 50 and everybody crowded around and said, oh, amazing. And she said, get used to it. This is what 50 looks like. <laughs> yeah. So 77, this is what 77 looks like. Yeah, exactly, like. you know, okay. exactly, right. Well, I love working with Misha. Um, That's person. Yeah. Who, thank, thank you. you. Who I think is, you know, so smart and so finely trained in such a, an array, I think maybe at the, at the school that, where he studied. Uh, I mean, they learned such an, an amazing amount of cultural information and he's just got such an amazing amount of know-how, no, no, not only about the theater, but about literature, about everything. So I, I had a wonderful time with him. He does say sometimes he's not a happy type and he gets gloomy, but um, I, I had a, I, it, it was wonderful working with him, uh, a, a real pleasure and a real learning experience and a real generous thing. Um, and um, I like Foreman very much. He's a strange man, um, prefers, I think, to do everything. You know, he was actually working in the piece that I worked with him, he was working with a lot of collaborators who were not necessarily present. And so he would make everything and cut the music. And, and then Peter Gordon came and said, wait a minute, you've cut. And we all had to have a little half hour off while they sorted that out. Because <laughs> Richard thought of it as sort of serial music and you just, if you cut out 16 bars here and 80 bars there, it was fine, you know, it was too long, it didn't need, um, but he, he's a he's a wonderful. I should say that my husband and I have an ongoing debate about his work because David loves his work and I'm not always so sure. Well, he's a he's a wonderful, interesting, and and actually curiously romantic man. I think if you if you really talk to him and he will admit something to you, that, which is something that he adores and it could be a, an instant in a Cocteau movie he did it to me one day and he almost blushed I think with pleasure and and I thought oh Richard you know how how charming you are <laughs> sometimes <you know. laughs> so I'm very I'm very fond of him and I w would be happy you know I would work with him again um, Wilson was a long time ago, and life has changed so drastically. I mean, his work is so different now. Um, and Wilson wasn't as present in the work that I was in as was Christopher Knowles, 
who was a young boy that worked with him who had, I don't exactly know what his, he had some physical yeah. uh, illness mm -hmm. thing, which made him sort of fearless. And he had no sense of how long things were. He could, could do things for hours. And I could do things for hours because I had gotten used to that, a kind of stamina with Merce. So I could run for hours. I mean, not fast, but I could jog or run. Or, so, so in rehearsals, we played together a lot. And that was sort of glorious. Um, so yes, I'm thrilled to have worked with all these people that I've worked, worked with. You know, um, It wasn't always easy, but um, it was always, I learned a lot. Oh, there's, another there's, there's another question. I see several questions down there, over here. I just wanted to say thank you for your time. This is such a pleasure, and you make such a wonderful story out of all of it. Oh, um, good. <laughs> but I'm really curious to hear about your working relationship with David, David Gordon, your husband. If you all <laughs> collaborate, uh, collaborate from the beginning, or if David made work for you, and what that collaborative process is like. Don't forget to tell about how you both come to the theater. I mean, you come hours ahead. He rushes in. Yeah, no, we're, we're very different people. Um, our training is, I mean, he was a fine arts major and uh, did not expect to be in the theater, but it happened, and there you are. Um, but his thinking is very different than mine. And I, you know, I walk into a theater, and it's wonderful, and it's home, and I love it and immediately. And he walks into the <laughs> and that seemed to be something that was interesting for people to watch these two people of such different temperaments working together. But we do have the most enormous trust of each other's working process. Um, he's harder on me than on anybody because if he gets hurt or disappointed or anything, he, he takes it out on me and I have to sometimes remember that it isn't. And then finally he might say, you know, this has nothing to do with you. It's really because of blah, blah, blah. Um, no, we don't. I mean, the ideas, he starts, probably he starts the ideas, but and I, I probably shape them in certain ways. But I don't know, recently in doing Dancing Henry V again, I play Falstaff for a minute and I die. And um, before I die, I, I sort of pull a cloth up over me like I'm in bed and I die. And I said to him, you know, why doesn't Mistress quickly then pull it up over my head so that you, I'm really dead? And he said, oh, that's of course a wonderful idea. And I said, you know, of course, you know, it's, I'm going to have a mic on, how are we going to work it? And he said, oh, we won't even worry. Don't even, don't even go there. Don't even think about that. You know, we'll do it. So, and it was my idea. And he said, it's a great idea. Um, so these, those things happen, but we, we also um, argue a lot, or he loves arguing. He says, he says it's actually, he thinks it's one of the things that is essentially extraordinarily Jewish about him. That argument is superb because it, it, it provides information. I'm not very good at arguing. My family were not of that vein. Actually, my mother and father fought, but that's not the same thing. <laughs> so I don't go there easily. But um, we, we, we wrestle it out and we get there. And uh, I think we, it's, it's hard but worth it. And I suspect that in all collaborations it's probably hard but worth it. And sometimes he says, it's so, why are you doing, it's so much, it's so large what you're doing, why are you? And then later he says, I'm wrong, I'm wrong, you're right, you know, they need it, they, it's working out there, you feel it, you, I, you know, you're right, I should, I, don't listen to me, and, <laughs> you know, and thank you for being here, and it goes on like that. I think you share downtime together, don't you? I mean, I, I mean yes. collecting stones. Yeah, well, that's Please. my thing. Okay. He's patient about my collecting rocks. Oh. But no, we shared, I mean, actually, he said yesterday, I, I was due to come here yesterday. 
And I went to the airport and they said, your plane's delayed, and then they finally said, your plane is canceled. So I managed to get home again. Uh, and uh, he said, well, you know, I'm really, I'm really sorry um, that this has happened, and I hope you can get out in the morning. But I'm actually thrilled to see you, because we'd, we'd just finished touring, and it was very hard. And we'd been in Albany, in the coldest theater in the world. Oh. And, um, and we'd driven through the night so I could get to New York, so I could make my plane yesterday. And he said, I'm so thrilled, you know, that you're here. And, and we can just have a nice time. And he'd bought some food, because we'd, we'd been away. There was no food in the house. And, and he said, you know, can I, he, can I make the soup for you? And can I do the, because you've got work. And I don't, but isn't this nice? And isn't this lovely? And we can have just a little. And he said again this morning, I'm so, I'm so pleased. I mean, we had little conversations, not lots, not terribly deep, but enough. And um, it was, yes, it was real. Those downtime things are, are really important and they, they support and stimulate the crazy times very much. Was there a question? Yeah. Excuse me. Thank you. And he challenges me, I mean, in what he gives me to do all the time, <laughs> which is good. Hi. Oh. Um, I'm Wendy Morris, and Valda, in the 80s, I took class with you. You taught off and on in Minneapolis, mm -hmm. and there were some things that you said that really had become a part of me that you just said in class. And I now teach in these leadership centers around the world where I'm using my dance background to help people think about collaboration and new ways of working. And I hear your words come out of my mouth. What were they? Like things like, <laughs> we'd be going across the floor, and I'd be struggling to keep up, and you just say, relax into speed. Yeah. Just relax into speed. And there were just these, these things that were way, be lessons way beyond what it was to get across the dance floor that have become just, that are just so in me, they come out, they just come out my mouth in these other settings. Well, how so lovely. I just wanted to share that. And then I also wanted to ask, what are, if there were like four things that you find yourself saying over and over again when you teach, what are they? I don't, I don't Wait, teach, all right. <laughs> I don't teach very much these days, actually, because I'm busy learning. Although I can learn from teaching, too, but I, I'm busy learning new things. Um, well, staying present in the moment all the time, uh, breathe. Um, Understand where your center is and that the floor supports you. Um, I think that's probably a large part of what has to happen, you know. I mean, honesty on a stage goes a very long way. I mean, the audience know what it's about, or people watching know what it's about. And your body knows what it's about. I mean, lack of tension, the wrong kind of tension, you know, will support you in the most extraordinary way. And um, some mix of all those things is what I think. Mm. <clears throat> Any other questions? You have a... You referred to the difference between dance breathing and theater breathing before. Could you talk about that? What is the difference? Well, in, in the, yeah. <laughs> in the ballet world, anyway, or in many technical situations, the breath happens much higher in the torso. The center is held much higher. Merce was actually one of the few people that really made me understand that the, the, his, for him, the center, as in Alexander, for instance, is really way down. And that's where the breath can come to. I mean, once you, once you start learning about the passage of the diaphragm, and, and that the diaphragm then frees, as the diaphragm lowers, it frees the ribs to open up. The, the amount of breathing that goes on in the back is not something that I had ever been taught as a dancer. 
Um, and what it does is, is enable you, or enable me now, in speaking lines, is, is that I don't, I don't have to stop because I need to breathe. I stop according to the sense of what I'm saying or something that happens from the audience that causes a reaction in me. Or, I mean, it gives me a real kind of support and freedom. And the ability, David actually in Dancing Henry V has, in this current version which we've just been doing, has made some adjustments, um, not in any way, because he doesn't like restoring things, restoring, reviving, all those words. He likes making. So shifts happen on the basis of it's now. It, it's not four years ago or eight years ago, or whatever. It's now. And um, there were times when I used to be able to leave the stage and get a drink of water. You need to keep the, the, the throat wet, as it were. And he's cut some of them out. And uh, I find I'm, I'm in pretty good shape, actually, because I know enough about breathing to, to support me. It's about support. It's really all about support. And once you learn that and you're not a sort of victim of, of running out of breath or any of those things, uh, it's, it's a great power, both as a dancer and as an actor, and I kept shifting between the two in, in this piece particularly. So I think that's what it's about, where it comes from, comes from a very relaxed place. The importance of, of the positioning of the head and upper spine, which is very much uh, an Alexander principle, um, which you know works gloriously. You have to you have to give it your attention and because it slips away easily enough, but if you will do it, it it really rewards you. I guess I think more about going deep than heightening. Uh, I mean, the result may be, perhaps be heightening, but I think about going deep. And I think that when you work with a good company, you immediately start to feel the, the pleasure and support that they give you. And they may be, you know, they may, I mean, we had a boy in, in this who, it was practically his first job, you know, so he, he didn't have a lot of experience, but boy, was he committed and was he terrific. And you, you, you value and use those things. And there's a very interesting book. It's about actors, actually, and it's about um, the, uh, certain actors are interviewed about how they work. And Philip Seymour Hoffman speaks wonderfully, whom I've worked with, actually, mm -hmm. speaks wonderfully about companies and how how he may be in something and he feels that somebody else isn't quite getting it or it isn't working or and and his job he feels is to help them it's not about criticism or they don't know what they're doing they're just a kid or they're not interested or whatever he he his job is to bring them into it and um, the generosity is is extraordinary and I I try and um, hold on to that because, because if I can give it to them, they start to give something back to me and, and the, the process, the whole. So I think I think of it that way and I don't really measure results at all until people start talking to me who've seen it or something, but it's not. I guess I, I don't think of it entirely. It's like cooking a good meal. You keep sort of saying, well, if we have this, how can we do that? And would this balance that? Or would this make a difference here because it's such a different texture? Or, and uh, you don't always necessarily talk about it, but you keep sort of burrowing around, especially in a group situation. and. Um, and I think it's a very give and take situation, but the give provides more giving from everybody else, and that seems useful. If you can find Mondays with Merce, it's a program on, it's on your computer. Um, 
I think they're very interesting because a woman named Nancy Dalva makes them and they're, they're, she found a, a way for Merce to have something to do on Mondays as he was <coughs> not as able, physically able as he had been. And uh, she juxtaposes it with interviews with people, there's one with me, and he talks about me. But he didn't know when he was talking about me that she would probably put it into a program with me talking about him and pictures of me dancing and all these things. Um, and they're very interesting, I think, and they're an astonishing way of sort of bridging history, which is a little bit more what you're talking about. Because he, 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 you see him as a very young man in some of them dancing um, and talking and talking about dancing. <laughs> and uh, I think I think that's sort of wonderful, and the the experiment that can that can lead to might be great. And I do think also that I think you know I thought that if Merce was alive when the tsunami happened, Merce would have made a piece that in some way reflected the tsunami. Now it wouldn't have been that there would have been bodies strewn all over the place and buildings falling down, but something about the power and the speed and the, the credible effect of it, I, I wonder if he wouldn't have made something that would have been visible on the stage. And I hope that what happens after the company ends, which I think is sort of right and glorious, um, I wonder what will happen with Merce's ideas and John's ideas and um, musicians and scientists and uh, you know philosophers and all that. I, I'd like to see where it all goes and I think that's really interesting and I think he would like that. So um, I don't know if that tells you anything. <laughs> and don't I remember that Merce felt that people were being trained so that they could perform now and do things that never, there was a different kind of training and possibly as people learn more about the body and about the, the mind and how it can be tapped into and used as uh, much more of a resource that the whole connection of mind-body is going to make much more possible as we learn more about it. Well, certainly the, the technical lever, I yeah. mean, the, the, the amount that, that the human bodies do now dancers do is, is so wildly more advanced than, or diverse, let us say, yeah, about advanced, yeah. diverse, than it was, uh, you know, when I joined the company, for instance, what the company is doing now yeah. on this sort of heroic two-year tour that they're doing is, is quite extraordinary and splendid. And that, part of that came about, really, I think, because most began to work with computers. Mm. And he said to me one day, you know, I, I'm making things without preparations. I mean, when he made them himself, even if he used chance, I think preparations were there because they were inevitable in, a, in his body. But when he started making them on, you know, live forms, whatever it was called, life, the, forms. life forms, they weren't necessary. So, and he said, you know, I'm, I'm trying things out on class and, you know, they can do them. <laughs> It's, it's amazing. And the, the newer people were faster at getting it than the older people. Um, and that sort of amused him um, and interested him. But um, I think, so already that's happened to a certain extent. What will happen next, I can't imagine, but I, I'm sure there'll be stuff out there. Well, I guess I'd like very much, and I might, actually manage to see them tomorrow before my plane. Because I don't really know exactly what they have. I know they have certain things that I worked on, like the antique meat sweater, which I made. Um, but um, that's, that's good to know. Yeah. And antique meat will be performed. Yeah. yeah, it was a It'll sweater be. that Merce designed and asked me, he said, can you knit? It was in 1958, you know, and I just arrived. and. He said, can you, you know, come to class and can you knit? And I said, yeah, I can knit and I knit it. Um, I, don't, I don't know yet because I haven't seen it. Um, and I think that if any of them rot 
which they might, ultimately, then that's their, that's their nature, you know. I mean, I said to somebody the other day, they said, oh, Martha's a billow, and actually, and I said, where's Martha? And he said, oh, she's with her mother, and mother's sort of ill and probably dying or leaving us or something. But he sort of said, you know, that's, that's what happens. And I remember seeing John, actually, in a Chinese restaurant. I, I met John in the street, and John said, how are you? And I said, oh, my mother died, and I was eating Chinese food in a restaurant with my son. And he said, yeah, well, that happens at a certain time of our lives, you know. And it, it all sort of made it seem very right, the impermanence of things. Mm -hmm. So I think it's wonderful that they're there. Um, I hope I can get to see them, if not this time, next time. Um, but, but there is a certain impermanence to everything, and, and uh, I think more than anything, 9-11 taught us that. So relish everything while you can, and see what happens. Mm -hmm. yeah. That may be a, yeah. Is that a good moment to... <laughs>